Welcome, my friends, to another edition of the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. You Notice my new cut? Well, if you're in financial planning, cash flow is number one consideration. And so I get my wife to cut my hair. It doesn't cost a dime. It looks just as good as the uh, barbers I had when I was in the Army. So uh, all is good and uh, you know, saved me a lot of money over time. So when I have my two boys and myself and my wife, my wife can... Uh, cut our hair for free compared to what, 20 bucks a pop. That saves a lot of money for sure. Of course, I like the hair short, so much easier to comb just like this, you're done. Nice thing about having short hair is wonderful. All right, so today I wanna to talk about capital gains using the new tax law and how you can benefit from it. So I've done a couple of podcasts on this thing. I've done tons of videos on the standard deduction and how the increase in standard deduction really, really can be to your benefit for sure, especially if in the middle class and you have large IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, TSPs, those qualified deferred accounts. You are going to get hammered when you hit 70 and a half. Even worse, you are going to get hammered if you are a surviving spouse because the RMDs do not go away. You still have the same RMDs you had required minimum distributions you had when you were married. It is contingent on your age, I get that. But assuming you and your spouse, your, your deceased spouse are roughly the same age, your RMDs aren't gonna change that much, but yet you've lost the standard deduction, your taxable income increases, your income tax bracket goes up, your Medicare B and D are subject to higher taxes as well, potentially not higher taxes, higher premiums. It's a, it's a nightmare. And again, I call it the widow's tax trap. So I want to encourage people to start while they have this 10 year window of opportunity, start using the increase in standard deduction. Again, if you're over 65 years old, each spouse has 13,000 bucks plus an extra $1,300. So a married couple filing jointly has $26,600 of standard deductions. You need to be using those. And I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about capital gains here, but I'm going to show you using the 1040, some of the ways you can kind of see how you can use the 1040 to see where you stand in terms of your standard deduction as well as a uh, capital gains tax. So let's go right into it. The place I want to start with is uh, this guy, Michael Kitsis, this guy right here, the guy in blue. Um, just a machine of uh, financial planning information. If you're just a consumer of financial planning information, he might not be your kind of guy simply because he is very detailed, very for the professional people like me. That doesn't mean you shouldn't read it. I'm just saying at the end of the day, if, if you just want some basic advice, he might be a little bit too in depth for it, but by all means, you make that decision on your own. He, uh, this guy just, he's got three kids at home, young kids, he's married, he flies all over the country. I don't know how he does it and puts out just the best planning information that's out there by far. Uh, Kitsis is the man. Um, hopefully, I don't know what the reward, the award is in financial planning, the Nobel Financial Prize or something like that. I, I don't know, but he deserves it for sure. But anyway, so capital gain strategies for highly appreciated investments after a big bull run. I want to talk about this a little bit. There's a couple pieces in here that are critical for you to understand, my friends. Since March 9, 2009 till today, the market has been on a tear. No getting around that. We've had about three, yeah, I hate to even call them bear markets because we haven't had anything even approaching a 20% decline from top to bottom. Nothing. We've had a couple things within spit distance from June, uh, July 15th, roughly to August eh, 20th or so, 2011. The market was down pretty good. Uh, May of 2013, the beginning of 2016, January to halfway through February 2016, or was that 2016? Uh, at one point this year, um, the market, you know, it fell a little bit, but not anything near the 20% that makes it officially a bear market, not even close. So we've been in this uh, significant bull run. Now, some of that is contingent on the fact that the markets got hammered 2001 and two from October 2007 to March 9th of 2009 and whatnot. But without question, we haven't had any major declines of any uh, significance whatsoever. So we are in the middle, if not the end of a bull run. I have no idea, but it's there. So Kids just talks about, I want to point out a couple of things here. I'm just going to read this. Obviously, you could read it too. I'll put the uh, link in the show notes below. Uh, Okay. First and foremost, it is important to recognize that avoiding capital gains in practice is worth less than most people realize. The conventional view is that if an investor has an investment purchase for $60,000 that now is up to $100,000 in the bull market, there's a 15% long-term gain that will cost the investor $6,000 in quote-unquote lost taxes. 
Thus, the invest the longer the investor holds, the longer he or she can kick, keep the six thousand dollars invested. So the theory here: I start with sixty; it's worth a hundred now. I got fifteen thousand or fifteen uh, percent on that forty thousand dollar game, which I'll owe, which will be six thousand dollars. I'm going to owe six thousand dollars on my forty thousand dollars of gain. The longer I defer the gain the more that $6,000 I would ordinarily pay tax also grow. So we call it double, you know, you're avoiding double, I hate to say double tax days, double tax deferral is what we'd call it. You're not only deferring taxes on the amount of money you gain, but you're deferring tax on the tax that you pay on the gain, which can also go back into your account. That's the benefit of deferring capital gains. But here's what Kitsa says. The truth is that unless there's a plan, and here's a three, I talk about three, he talks about two ways to avoid the tax. Unless there's a plan to die or donate the asset, the investor will pay $6,000 of taxes. It's already a tax liability established on the person personal balance sheet, albeit a deferred one. In other words, the investor's net worth is already actually just $94,000 because the tax obligation is there, even if it hasn't matured yet. A couple of things I do take issue with this. If you look at any balance sheet, the tax liabilities are not there. You never see them. If you go to a bank and want to borrow money, they'll give you the balance sheet, which is your assets on one side, your liabilities on the other. Your assets minus your liabilities is your total net worth. The, the, the tax liability is never there, which which greatly, greatly, greatly can overestimate your, your total net worth for sure. Uh, so I, I challenge that in some regard, but I, I see what he's saying. Uh, the second part is three ways um, you don't pay taxes. One is if you die, you don't pay tax because there is something called a step up in basis. As long as the account is not in an annuity, an IRA, a qualified account, as long as it's in a taxable account or a non-qualified account, if you die, your heir will receive the property and not pay any tax on it whatsoever. It's called step up in basis. And that's a wonderful rule that we have. Uh, secondly, you can always donate the asset. You can donate it to charity and then you don't pay tax on it. The drawback is you don't own it anymore. The charity owns it. Charity can do whatever they want with it. So if you need that money uh, to put food on the table, if you donate that asset to avoid paying tax, that's not going to do any good because you don't own it. Charity owns it, which is why you have the tax deferral, um, not tax deferral, which is why you can donate without paying taxes. There is a third way. What happens if the market falls? All right, so now we have a 20% decline. Let me get my trusty little Texas instrument. So before we had a $40,000 capital gain, uh, but we deferred it because we didn't want to pay that $6,000 tax. We didn't want to pay that. So now the markets fall 20% to 80,000. So now we've put in 60, it was worth 100, but now because the market's declined, it's now only worth 80. So we've lost 20,000 on our gain, or essentially we've only gained 20,000 on our initial investment of 60,000 bucks. What does that mean? That means we have 20,000 tax at 15%. So we don't pay tax on 6,000, but we don't pay $6,000 in tax. We only pay $3,000. So we sacrifice $3,000 in tax and we lost, or we saved 3,000 bucks in tax, but we lost $20,000 of total net worth. Yeah, that's not a good trade. So we don't want that third thing to happen. So what Kitsis is saying is maybe the tax deferral for deferring capital gain because you don't want to pay the 6000 maybe it isn't quite as valuable as you might think. So let's see what he says. Um, nonetheless, that means avoiding a deferring capital gains doesn't actually save the investor $6,000. It actually just defers the taxes, allowing it to grow in the meantime which means the real value of managing capital gains is just the growth on the $6,000, which at 8% growth rate is only $480. So to avoid paying tax on 600, uh, 6,000, we're hoping to gain 480. All right, well, 480 on the entire of our 94,000 total after tax net worth is only 0.51%, that's it. That's the economic value of deferring tax is 0.51% or $480 on a total asset that's net worth to you because after taxes is $94,000. Yeah, that's not much of a gain. And what I like Kitsa says, obviously an extra 0.51% a year return certainly is better than nothing, but it's still rather modest compared to an investment that could lose 20% or more in a bear market. So like I just said, it's, 
we're, we're saving $6,000, deferring $6,000 because we don't want to pay tax. And on top of that, we're hoping that deferral can get us an extra $480 on if we get 8%. On the other hand, the it's rather modest that 480 compared to the $20,000 we just lost because a not unusual bear market. Remember, folks, the market falls about every four to four and a half years, 20%. There's no pattern to it. It doesn't go up, 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 down, up, 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 down. It just goes up and down as completely random. But historically, the market has fallen 20% or more every four to four and a half years. We haven't had that fall since 2009. Now, I'm just saying. That, I mean, you should go and you know put all your assets in gold. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that there's a chance the market is going to fall 20%, which would mean your $100,000 portfolio would drop to 80 Yes, your tax rate, your taxes will be lessened by half, sure. Uh, but you just lost 20% of your portfolio to save $3,000 on tax. Not a good trade-off. Um, for what, And he just kind of talks about how much, the less of a gain you have, the less, uh, the less not only less taxes you pay, but the less benefit it is to deferring it. So if you have a 15 to 20% gain, was what he says here, 15 to 30%. The annual value of tax deferrals even less, which is what he shows here. Uh, I want to talk about. All right, here's what I'm going to talk about right here. Um, this right here for married couple filing jointly, you don't pay any capital gain at all if you're up to about seventy six thousand dollars in income, taxable income. That is after after your standard deductions, all right? So if you have taxable income at 70, 76,000 bucks, you pay no capital gain tax whatsoever if you're married filing jointly. Over that, you start paying 15% on long-term capital gains like everybody else does on the amount that's above that. So, if, so the example I wanna use with you here, let's say Joe and John, Jane, they got $50,000 of taxable income. Now, just be advised. I want you to see financial professional on your taxes, on your legal, all that stuff. I'm just giving you ideas to put in your head. So don't take this as gospel. It's not the gospel truth. It's just an idea for you to start using your tax brackets up to your advantage. And I'll show you exactly what that means here in a second with the visual. But let's just say a $50,000 of taxable income. The tax bracket where you can avoid paying capital gains is $76,000 roughly. That gives you $26,000 thousand dollars my friends of income that you can use to sell a highly appreciated or even just a lowly appreciate asset before you pay any capital gain tax whatsoever you got fifty thousand you can go up to seventy six thousand yeah seventy six thousand twenty six thousand is a gap you have a stock that you bought in 2009 and now it's worth fifty thousand more than what you bought it was well if you sell a portion of the proceeds of that stock as long as you don't go above 75.9 all in, that's going to be tax free to you. And that's not a bad idea, especially if you had intentions of using that stock for putting food on the table later on in your life. That's not a bad strategy in the least to start taking advantage of your capital gains uh, for sure. So I want to show you something. This is the 2000, uh, 2017 1040. Now, 2018 1040 isn't out yet. Um, at least I'm not aware. I don't think it is. But anyway, I want to show you what to look at here. This is what I want you to look at. Line 13, that is your capital gain or loss, line 13. So let's, that's off Schedule D. So if you have a number right here, that's the amount of capital gain that you have to report to the IRS. All right, now if your income is above, and this is your adjusted gross income, I'm talking your taxable income, is above right here, line 43. If your taxable income is above 76, roughly 76,000, 75,000, let's just say 75,000 for simplicity, um, then you have to pay 15% on anything above the 75. If your income is below 75, the, the amount that you have on line 13 up to $75,000 is tax free. Tax free. So we look at this right here, taxable income. We say our taxable income is 50,000 bucks. We come up here and we say, well, we didn't sell any stock because we don't want to pay tax on it. So we're going to keep our stock to avoid paying tax. 
And I say, well, Mrs. Smith, you have $20,000 of gain in the stock. We don't like the stock for whatever reason, or the stock has grown too much, or I don't care. At the end of the day, though, we can take that $20,000 of gain and sell it, and nothing is going to show up here as a long-term capital gain for a tax perspective. Nothing, because you remain under that threshold of roughly $75,000. Now you could say, but I like to, okay, you might like the stock. You could say, well, I want to leave it to, you know, my nephew who's starting a business. That's fine. I don't care what it is. Just what is the plan? We have to have a plan for what we're doing to take advantage of the tax code. And right now the tax code is very, very favorable. Bush signed these into law in 2003, Obama and Boehner, they had a good bipartisan agreement in 2012 to extend it. And it's been extended with the TCGA, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017. Now, those will have a sunset provision, too, just like they all do anymore. And I think it's 2026. So essentially, I'm telling people, you got about 10 years to get your tax situation situated. Facts are, the facts are. We don't know what's going to happen in 2026, but I will be, I'm not hesitant to suggest given the 20 to 20 trillion dollars, 20 to 21 trillion dollars of debt that we have today, given the deficits that we're taking on to add to the debt, given our unfunded liabilities of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, the big three, we are not sitting pretty when it comes to financial standing with our cash flow, that's for sure. Cash has got to be generated somehow. They're going to generate by either inflating, basically the base in the currency, or they're going to start increasing taxes. I don't know what it's going to be, but at some point, you got to pay the piper. So if we can pay a little bit of tax today to avoid future huge increases potentially in the future, we should do that for sure. And one of the easiest ways is take advantage of the tax code. Tax code is there. Take advantage of it. For heaven's sake, take advantage of what the long-term gain tax code are for you if you're in a certain tax bracket. So remember, we want to look at uh, line 13 on your 1040. Now, here's what schedule D is critically important. This is your capital gain and loss report that you send every year to the IRS. Now, here's what I want to show you. See this guy right here, line 14 on Schedule D. That is your capital loss carry forwards. So my friends, if you have a number here, and you, so let's just say it's 15,000 bucks, and then you look at your brokerage account statement and you have a gain in a stock, again, not in an IRA, in a stock that is 15,000 bucks. If there's a reason that you don't want to hold a stock anymore, I don't know what it is, but you're saying, I don't want to sell it because I don't want to pay tax on it. You're wrong because this $15,000 right here on line 14 will offset that $15,000 on that stock. That's just a fact. This is a call capital loss carry forwards. If you have capital loss carry forwards and you are not using them and you have stocks that have a gain in them, and there's a reason you should diversify, a reason you should sell a position, whatever it is, you should be doing this. Now, this right here has nothing to do with your tax bracket. You could be Bill Gates right here and have $20,000 of a capital loss carry forward and $20,000 of gains in Microsoft stock. Well, for heaven's sake, take advantage of that. Sell $20,000 of gains in Microsoft stock and use your capital loss carry forwards. Capital loss carry forwards are an asset. That's a fact. That means you sold something in the past for a less than what you bought it at, which means you have a capital loss, which you can carry forward to offset future gains until you die. And then the capital loss carry forwards that go, they're gone. They don't transfer you to, with you at depth. They don't transfer to your heirs. They're gone. So take advantage of your capital loss carry forwards by looking at line 14 of the Schedule D under 1040. So again, look at here's your 1040. All right. We want to look at line 13, your capital gain or loss. And if you have a gain in there and then you look at your Schedule D, which hopefully, hopefully is being used and you have capital loss carry forwards, that should automatically trigger the gain to be wiped off. I don't know. But let's say you don't have a gain in there. You don't have a gain because you've elected not to sell anything for a gain. And you look at your Schedule D and lo and behold, you have capital loss carry forwards. Well, let's start thinking about this. Let's start using tax code to our benefit. All right. So something else I want to point out too on the 1040. Here's lines 8A, B, A, and D, or 8A and B, and 9 and B. Now, these are taxable interest, interest from CDs, interest from tax bonds, 
which is interest that you pay, that you receive from a bond, a CD, an investment of some sort, it pays you an interest as taxable. Here's tax exempt interest, and that is your municipal bonds. Okay, so we have taxable interest and tax exempt interest that comes over here on line 8A. Here we have ordinary dividends. All right, that's just dividends you receive. Then we have quali qualified dividends. Qualified dividends are taxed much, much more favorably than ordinary. Most people have qualified dividends. Some will have a little bit of ordinary dividends, but most of their dividends today will be in qualified, which means they're taxed favorably. All right, so what we have, if we have numbers on either of these guys, all right, that means we have in taxable income from our investments. We've received a 1099. Now, if you have a 1099 from either line 13, line 8A or 9A, that means you have a taxable income. Now, you can also have taxable income even if you have done no transactions. And the example I use all the time is I had a client. She had $200,000 of American Century mutual funds. The mutual funds lost 20% in a year. I think it's 2013. Maybe I can't remember. 2013 or 14, I forgot. But they were down about 20%. I don't know why, but they're down that much. So 200000 fell to 160. She got a tax bill of roughly $40,000, even though the accounts dropped in value by 20%, even though she did not sell them. She didn't sell them. She just held it. Still got this tax bill of $40,000. Why? Because the mutual funds inside of her account the fund managers were buying and selling stuff, had issued capital gains, were paying interest and dividends and whatever else they have, they had bonds. They were distributing their income back to her as a shareholder because under the Investment Company Act, I think it was the 1940 or one of the mutual fund acts that they had back in you know, 39, 40, don't quote me, but that's when all this stuff happened in 1939, 40. Any income the mutual fund receives has got to be distributed. I think like 95% or something like that, got to be distributed to the shareholders. So even though her account started the year at 200000 fell to 160 by year end, even though she did no selling or buying, didn't do anything, the facts were she hired an investment manager, American Century Mutual Funds, and they start buying and selling stuff inside her mutual funds that she owned. Even though the account went down, they still had to distribute those capital gains, interest income, and dividend income to her as a shareholder as well. So she had a number here. She had a number here and she had a number here, which means she had 1099 distributions, which means she had taxable income, even though she felt she should not have it. whatever. She had it. She got to pay it. That will go to the bottom line right here. This is your AGI. Now, after your exemptions, she was a single taxpayer. So back then it was a 12,000 bucks. So let's just say it's 12,000 bucks now. Well, she had $40,000 of dividend, of dividend capital gain interest distributions. She only has $12,000 deduction. So inherently, she has $26,000 added to her AGI or taxable income, I should say. That's uh, that was a, that was that did not make her happy. But that's the way the tax laws are written. So on the counter of that, I say, well, why do we have these mutual funds if we're losing money and they're paying you big distributions? And so we, I won't get that this episode, but there is other things we can do for that going forward in the future. At the end of the day, though, I want you to look at your stuff to see if you have itemized uh, items in 8, 9, and 13. If you do, my friends, we have some work to do. we got to look at Schedule B. Schedule B is your, and I don't have it up here. Schedule B is what you uh, get for interest, dividends. Schedule D is your capital gains. All right, so we look at Schedule B and Schedule D to see what kind of investment income you're going to have. If we have numbers in these areas, we need to start planning. Absolutely. And, and again, that's irrelevant of tax, your tax bracket that has just solely to do if you have investments that are paying you some sort of income, be it capital gain, dividend or interest. All right. Lastly, just because it says tax exempt interest. If you are facing Social Security, you are going to use that tax exempt interest in order to find out how much Social Security tax you got to pay or tax on your Social Security, I should say it. So if you have a number here under 8B and you're on Social Security, <laughs> that will be used to determine your provisional income for how much taxes you're going to pay on Social Security. So we got to look at the 1040. we got to look at 1040. Everyone just looks at 7 and they look at 37 for your AGI. And I don't even think that many people even look at their actual 43, which is your taxable income, and 44, which is your tax. 
they just look at seven, which is your W-2. They look at 37, which is your AGI. They might look at the amount of deductions they have, but very, very few people say, hey, what is my total tax? And that's totally based on taxable income. And that's what you should be doing. Absolutely. So let's wrap this up. A couple of things. We have a very favorable tax code right now for people who have an investment income. There's no other way around that. It depends on your tax bracket, first and foremost. If your tax bracket is in the 10 to 12 percent range, you have ability to use that to, to, to basically not defer, but to sell positions and potentially pay zero percent capital gain. Got to be clear. Once you go over that 12 percent threshold, then you will be subject to capital gain tax at 15 percent on the amount of above the 12% threshold you went. So just be clear, if you sell uh, you know, a share of Apple that you bought in 1922 for a million dollars and you're only making 10,000 a year of income, you're not, that is not all subject to tax-free. That's not all tax-free. That will put you above the, ca the category where you're gonna have to pay capital gain tax, a large capital gain tax for sure. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Two, if you have capital gain distributions, do you have capital loss carry forwards? If you don't have cap, if you don't have capital gain distributions, but you have deferred capital gains in a position you held, and you look at your Schedule D on your 1040, and you have capital loss carry forwards, consider selling some of those stocks or bonds. Or probably not bonds, but stocks. Your some of your investments to use up your capital gain, capital loss carry forwards. It'll be a wash. You don't owe any tax on it because you have the loss over here. You can offset the gain over here with the loss over there. Psh, washes out clean as the winter and snow. So we want to use that. B, if you have gain or you have income in eight or nine, all right, and you have funds that you haven't traded or anything like that, we probably need to look at that as well to take advantage of some of the opportunities that, that are out there to get you in a little bit more tax efficient manner. We don't want you to have interest income, dividend income, and, uh, and, and capital gain income if, if we can avoid that, especially if you're making pretty good money while you're still working. We want to avoid that at all costs. All right, my friends, well, I hope this helps. This is a first uh, edit, well, not editorial, what's the word I'm looking for? A tutorial, I suppose, on the tax code. The 1040 is your friend if you look at it. 1040 is your enemy if you don't. You got to be looking at your 1040. You got to be looking at it. How did they derive it last year in 2017? 2018 is going to be different. How do we know that? Well, because let's look at 2017 and it'll say right here, that is your standard deduction. 6,300 if you're married or single, excuse me, or 1,270 if you're married filing jointly. Going forward, your standard deduction is 12,000 if you're single and 24,000 if you're married filing jointly. If you're above 65 years old and married filing jointly, it's 26,600. If you're above 60, 65 years old and you're single, it's 13,300. Let's use those standard deductions to our advantage, our advantage to reduce the taxes that somebody's going to pay at some point. All right. If this has been helpful to you. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up. Absolutely. Subscribe down there. See that little button that says subscribe. Hit it. Hit the little notification bell so you can be notified of future content. And as always, don't forget to put comments down below. Uh, don't forget to visit the webpage, heritagewealthplanning.com. Go to my podcast at the Josh Scanlon podcast, Josh Scanlon podcast. Spelled just like it's well, actually it's not spelled S-C-A-N-D-L-E-N is how you spell my last name. So don't forget to go to the podcast as well. We'll see you next time on the Heritage Wealth Planning uh, YouTube channel. Thanks, guys.